Hello, I'm Joe Chamberlain, the Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar series, and in particular, this one, which is by the famous Alvaro Jaramillo, specific to the raptors of Wavecrest. This is a particularly good time to learn about our raptors at Wavecrest because the migration is just getting in full swing and you'll be able to see lots and lots of birds at Wavecrest. A little bit about the logistics and then we'll get on to Alvaro. So a copy of this webinar will be on our website uh, sometime by before Monday. As a registrant, you will also receive a copy of the link to that web, this webinar for your use and to share with others. And we certainly hope you will. The more we learn about these gorgeous creatures, the more we can do to protect them. Other logistics are Alvaro will speak uh, and with his presentation and then there'll be a Q&A at the end. If you would like to answer, uh, ask a question, please uh, click on the Q&A and type in your question. If it's a question that our uh, able-bodied social manager, Kate Dickey can answer, she will do that. Otherwise, we'll hold the questions for the end for Alvaro to answer. Let's see, other things are that uh, these are free webinars. However, we are very grateful for any donations you can make to help keep this program going, help us protect additional lands, and keep our many programs for the community going. So Alvaro, uh, many of you know, I'm sure, is very active in sharing and teaching about birds and wildlife, but also primarily birds. He is has a depth of expertise that is unequal to anyone that I have worked with in this area. And he's always surprises me, even though I've had several presentations over the last 10 years from Alvaro. Every time he gives a presentation, I learn new things and I'm so grateful to him for that. It enriches my life and I certainly hope that it will enrich yours. So please join me in welcoming Alvaro Jaramillo, Raptors of Wavecrest, Half Moon Bay. Thank you, Joe. Um, I, I'm always happy to talk to uh, Coastside Land Trust supporters, uh, local people here in Half Moon Bay uh, about Half Moon Bay because we really are in, a, in an amazing part of the world um, for wildlife and specifically birds. I mean, California is really a great state for uh, bird diversity and us on the coast, we're really in, in a wonderful spot to, to see birds and in particular raptors. But <clears throat> I always like to start with this um, slide to just give you an idea of diversity. We have so many different types of birds here from you know this huge great blue heron to this little tiny Anna's hummingbird, the way they do things, the way they feed, their migrations, their nesting, everything about every one of the birds we have in, in the area is different. So you can always get into more and more depth with anything, um, with any wild creature, but we just have so much here. And I just wanna start with, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And in many cases, I'll be talking to you about what things look like, what these raptors look like, but there's a wealth of other information that we just don't have time to get into. And specifically, we, we talk about this area called Wavecrest, which is um, uh, right, let's see, if you uh, see my little pointer here, you can see that the town of Half Moon Bay back there, Montero Mountain and so forth, the actual bay is there. And then Wavecrest is this area here, um, see the edge of the golf course and the community there. And it's, it's a wonderful uh, area of open space. It's a big area, but it also has connections. You know, if, uh, if you go further south, and sort of right along north, right on the edge of town, there are connections of other open areas and also to the agricultural and the hills just above, above you know, to, to the right of this photograph. And that's part of what makes it special. It's, it's large enough to hold sizable populations of birds and it's connected and also right on the coast. So it's sort of really on, there's an edge uh, situation there, uh, birds, 
wildlife in general like edges. So the coast is really the most extreme edge you can have. And in that case, it sort of funnels movement um, north and south because we're on a coast. We have that sort of funneling effect during migration. And here's you know uh, a map from above to show you um, again the city of Half Moon Bay over here, golf course down here, um, and all of these little plots. And later, maybe you know Joe can tell you more about the different. Um, activities they have in trying to buy up some of these plots that are still not preserved. So the green and the blue is land that's protected and the, the other places are spots that are still um, needing protection if we want to keep this entire area um, safe for us to use, to walk our dogs, to look, look for birds and for the raptors themselves. So that's key. And um, here we go. First of all, why raptors, right? Raptors, people like hawks, you know, people like eagles. And they, you know, I, I love this little cartoon because I think the birds themselves know they're pretty cool. And we, we gravitate to, to raptors. Now there are diurnal raptors like eagles and hawks and there are nocturnal raptors like owls. And I'm gonna talk mostly about the diurnal ones because you know, you just start running out of time if you, if you try to sneak everything in there but they're among the most liked, well-known um, birds we have. I mean, people, even people who don't know much about birds can tell you, you know, that an eagle's big and that a falcon is fast and so forth. It's not, you know, um, it's, it's not a coincidence that so many raptors are used as national symbols, um, you know, from eagles, golden eagles, bald eagles to, um, condors in other parts of the world, etc. So it's uh, it's definitely a um, a set of birds that people like and gravitate to. Now, not everything that you know eats um, lizards or or birds is a raptor. So there are other birds that actually do prey on other creatures. And they're not raptors. So this is a loggerhead shrike, a species that's actually become quite rare locally. And no, they don't have the big, big old claws, the talons of a hawk or a falcon, but they have a really nice big hooked bill. And they will eat lizards and they will eat things that are actually pretty big for their the size of the bird, like a you know, little mouse. But these shrikes are not considered raptors, right? The raptors are the hawks, eagles, falcons, in terms of the diurnal raptors. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting in, in today's world, you know, I think when we started doing this, maybe 10 plus, more than 10 years ago, um, we, we didn't think that hawks and falcons were unrelated. We figured they were all kind of in the same, same group. Now with genetic techniques, molecular techniques that show who's related to what. Something really amazing has happened that falcons are actually more closely related to parrots than uh, hawks are. So they, the two groups, although they are, they're similar in many ways, they've come to that similarity sort of through convergence on the fact that they both are eating birds or mammals and they need to be certain size and need to have a certain flight style, but they're not actually related to each other, which I think is, is pretty interesting in itself. So here's a hawk and here's a falcon, a Cooper's hawk and a peregrine falcon. And one of the key aspects of raptors is their wonderful eyesight. This, this whole idea of you know, somebody who has eagle eyes because they really, you know, great vision is, is a, a true fact. These raptors like eagles have really acute vision. They can see in detail from a distance um, and, and see stuff that we cannot see. It's, it's as if they had binoculars, you know, or a telescope in, in their heads and can see at certain places really, really high definition. So at, a, at a, an amazing distance, they can see the movement of a mouse or a bird and they can process it all very quickly. Sometimes when they're zooming down, you know, in a, a dive at hundreds of miles an hour, they're processing all this information. So the fact that they 
They have eyes that face forward is really key because that allows them to have real good depth perception. And um, they, they also have relatively um, big eyes too. So if you, if you look at that, in many cases, they also will have a little like, um, little kind of crest right above the eye that protects the eye. They sort of have a, a like a little umbrella above them and that gives them this this sort of frowny face look at times that you might kind of think about when you see a raptor. That's all about protecting the eyes and actually shading. The, um, the mustache stripes of a falcon are actually kind of like counter shading in a, in a way that decreases the glare. You know, just, just like football players put that black underneath the eyes, it's exactly what falcons have. So we're, we're kind of on, you know, in a raptor freeway as they move south, because we are along the coast, we're sandwiched in between mountains and coasts. So if any bird is moving in the lowlands, they get to the coast and just sort of start moving south in the in the fall or you know north in the spring, and uh, that that allows us to have some concentrations of raptors here. Also, the mountains themselves are a a corridor of movement for for some of the hawks when they're migrating. And you know why they stop here is one of the reasons is there's a lot of food, especially voles. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a, in a second. But one of the magic bits about these, these raptors is that they can see um, wavelengths that we cannot see. And one of that, that set of wavelengths or that set, a certain set of wavelengths that they can see are the actual urine trails that these little mice um, where rodents leave in the grass. So they can be flying over and actually have, you know, see that there's a lot of food there, that it's active, and then they will stop. So if they're going along this, mig you know, migratory highway, and some of them are kind of looking for a place to hang out for the winter, they see all the food, and then they stop here once they see all those urine trails. So they, 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 they it's like, a, you know, um, eat here symbol sign you know, outside of a restaurant that they can see. All right, so let's start looking at some of these birds and sort of one by one, species by species, and we'll see what, what they look like. And also we'll contemplate other things like this is a turkey vulture and it is in the group. It is related to the hawks as it's in that same group. However, it does not have really strong talons, you know, like a like a falcon, like an eagle. It has very weak feet. They have very strong beaks, and they don't actually kill any food. They don't hunt for for anything live. They they eat dead things, right? Carrion, and uh, we sort of allow them to be in the raptor group, even though they're not behaving like a raptor because they are related to them and they're big and you know they if they're uh, vultures flying over you think raptor you automatically think oh, is that a hawk is that an eagle what is it it's a vulture so uh, so we'll keep them as an you know as a raptor um, some places in in north america they call this bird the buzzard although the buzzard is an entirely different kind of hawk that's found in europe so keep that in mind i don't know why the name buzzard was you know taken to, to refer to the turkey vulture, but they, they're a funny shape, the turkey vultures. And the fact that they're kind of long, dark, and have the, this red on the head is, reminds you of a turkey. So that's why they're called turkey vultures. And it's, I used to say that, you know, they, they defecate on their legs to keep cool. They actually do poo on their legs. <laughs> and it, it, in fact, now they think that this decreases the, the harmful bacteria that the acid nature of, of their fe fecal matter actually cleans their legs. So often their legs will have kind of a white chalky look. That's, that's actually crusty bird poo, believe it or not, guano. And um, when turkey vultures fly over, they actually look pretty big and um, have this real sort of V-shaped um, style of flight. It's called the dihedral and they rock. You'll see them rocking. So that's one of the ways you identify them as turkey vultures. So everybody's, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are paying attention to the Olympics right now. And I would, I thought it'd be fun to put in a few kind of little factoids here, kind of our Raptor Olympics of things that some of these birds do that are pretty amazing. And, and the turkey vulture wins in the smell category. 
And what I'm saying here is that they can find their food at a great distance by smelling that, that you know, dead animal. And in fact, they're so acute that they can find a dead animal within the forest when they're flying over, they can smell it and actually cue in and go down and fly down into, into the trees and find that dead animal. So it's really, really an acute sense of, of smell. So they have, when they've been studied, they found that their olfactory bulbs in their brain, which is the part that processes the smell, it's bigger than on any other bird relative to their brain size compared to other birds. Albatrosses are also birds that smell quite, you know, have a good sense of smell. And they also have these cells within their brain called mitral cells that transmit information about smell to the brain. And they have the highest density of these cells of any bird on earth. So these are sort of the Olympic smellers, are the, the turkey vultures. Now, our our prettiest raptor, I think, in many ways, is because it's so clean looking and elegant, is the white-tailed kite. And they also are perhaps, you know, if you had to choose a wave crest flagship species, I would say it's the kite because they can get together in good densities in some years when there's a lot of food. The kite is white underneath and they have these had devilish red eyes when you see them up close. And these pointy wings, although not super, super pointy like a falcon, it's just sort of a little rounded point, long white tails and uh, black shoulders, sort of a black patch above the wing and also a black patch below the wing. So they're really quite also easy to separate from other raptors. They're just sort of so unique in their simple, elegant and, and distinctive coloration. And they're they're getting, they're starting to show up now. There's a few that, there's at least one nest in, in the wave crest area, but in winter we have um, higher numbers. And here's a kite with a kite. And um, people always ask like, who got the name first, the toy or the bird? I think the bird actually was the first to, to have the name kite. And it was a European species, the red kite um, that was likely the one that had that name. You know, if you read Shakespeare, there's kites mentioned in Shakespeare. And um, then the toy was probably named for the bird since it hover, you know, sort of does this kiting behavior that these white-tailed kites will sort of stop and, and, you know, sort of fly into the wind and just stay really motionless like a kite. Um, and, you know, youngsters, adults, they look pretty much the same. So if you if you look at this one on the left, that's an adult. And this one on the right is a, a youngster, a juvenile. There's just a little hint of sort of a streaky area on the breast. They have the same general pattern of being white, long tailed. Their eyes are dark. They're not sort of that devilish red. And see these dark areas under the wings too that are, are really obvious when they fly over. And that pointed wing that is pointed, but not super sharp. There's a little rounded nature to, to the, um, um, to the, the wings. And um, let's see here. One thing we should talk about though is what these birds eat. The kites, later I'll tell you about the harriers, red-tailed hawks, uh, to some extent red-shouldered hawks. They all eat um, the field mice, which are known as California voles. Uh, that's the official name for that that little mouse-like creature that you see out in the fields. Some people call them field mice and they're related to the lemmings of the Arctic. So if you've ever heard of the lemmings that sometimes you know, are really, really common and you know, be, are en masse and so forth, they, like the lemmings, have these cycles where they become super common and then they sort of crash. And our cycles tend to be three years to four years so every once in a while we have just a super abundance of California voles and it tends to be in the, in the fall and into the winter. So it's usually, yeah, late summer into the, into the early winter when the numbers are highest. And that is when the raptor show really happens at, at wave press. And there can be just, you know, densities of white-tailed kites. Nobody really exactly understands why these animals go through these booms, boom and busts, but multiple mammals do its hares and, you know, various places, lemmings and other rodents. So it's, it's sort of um, something that happens. We just don't understand it all that well. Um, 
And in a raptor Olympics, this is, this is not about any specific bird, but it's about wave crest itself. And it's just the numbers of birds that can be there. I, I personally have in one of those good years seen counted more than 75 white tailed kites at wave crest at one day. And I think there are other numbers that were higher and um, I, I couldn't find, you know, in searching, but um, that's a lot of raptors in one spot. And the max red tail hawks that I could find were 35 in, in a one, you know, one day, one outing, 15 Northern Harriers. So you can get the sense for when it's really hopping out there, that is a real world-class site for, for raptors. And in terms of species, there have been 16 species of diurnal raptors seen at Wavecrest. And just that little patch that I showed you in the, in the map and in, in the photo before, um, some of them are unusual, others are, are here all the time. So I'm, I'm talking to you about the species that are here each year that are regular, but there are others that can show up like this rough-legged hawk. Rough-legged hawk has um, real kind of black and white kind of look. It's an Arctic hawk, and every so often they show up in the Half Moon Bay area or in the coast side, and ha they have been seen out there at at Wavecrest. I've, I've seen them around in the Half Moon Bay area, but actually never seen this one at Wavecrest. So there's always more stuff to look for. This is one of our regulars, the Northern Harrier. Uh, the males have a blue-gray coloration. This is a male that sometimes known as the blue ghost uh, or the gray ghost. The, there's, um, they, they are a funny hawk because if you start watching them, one of the things they do is they fly very low they, they're not way up high, they're flying very low. And like that, the vulture, they have that dihedral where they teeter. And um, they, it's, it seems sort of like a weird way to fly with that teetering nature. But if you think about it, if they're really down low when there's sort of a lot of, you know, turbulence and sort of heat pockets of air rising and so forth, if you're, you have this, this teetery na nature, if you teeter to one side, you, the wing that's down here suddenly starts getting more lift and it lifts you back up. So then you're, you're teetering, but you're sort of always being buoyed by whatever wing is sort of lowest and it's bringing you back up to this balance. It's a, it's, um, a way that to fly in, um, in more turbulent or you know, areas of where the wind and the air aren't quite uh, steady and you know, just uh, like further up, you know, in, in the sky. And it's a great way also to turn in, in quick circles. And that's what uh, vultures do with those wings too. When they find a rising column of air, they can turn in a quick circle and stay within that rising column of air. So here's the male harrier. A few things to look, look at. They have very long wings and sort of very long outer part of the wing, long tails. There is a white patch on the rear end here, the butt. And they have kind of a flat face and I'll, talk to you about that in a second here. The females and juveniles are brownish. The juveniles can be cinnamon, like almost, you know, kind of pumpkin colored, like half moon bay colors. Um, and then see they have that white kind of stripe right at the base of the tail on the rump that you can see very long legs. And then that flat face with really kind of like discs that stick out like an owl. And that's important because they do actually find a lot of their food by hearing for it. So they're flying close to the ground, kind of an ambush predator where if they see something, they will quickly drop down with these long legs and try to catch the vole, or they listen for rustling and they'll turn back around and try to try to catch that, that vole. They, they do have these really long outer parts of the wings. So, what you call the hand is very, very long. And it's actually a lot of little stripiness to it. But once you start looking at hawk shapes, one of the things that stands out about them is that they have these really super long outer wings, long tails, and the way they fly. But they are owl-like in many ways, and they can actually stay hunting later in the day than most raptors. If you're at Wavecrest in the evening, you'll see that a lot of the other hawks will have gone to roost and the harriers are still running around, you know, after sunset because they can listen for their food. So here's a, a male 
So there was a, a young male with the gray coming in, and then this is a juvenile that's got all that cinnamon look to it. All of them, no matter what age, have the same shape and that white on the rump, so in the way they fly. So keep that in mind if you're looking for, for them out at Waycrest. And it's a, it's, a, it's a species that during the fall, winter, they're, they're always around there. So there's always a, a few or sometimes a dozen or so to look for. I just want to point out that in the winter, and I said I wouldn't talk about owls that much, but here's a, here's a special one. This is an owl that comes to winter in Wavecrest. Very specifically, it's one of the best places in, in, on the coast to see the short-eared owl. It sort of takes over from the, the harrier at night, and they they like the same kind of habitats, which are grassy, open habitats. And this, this is sort of the day team. And then the night team is this very, also very long winged owl. The, so it has a shape that's almost like the harrier. And um, they come in the winter. And if you're wanting to see them, you have to have to be there right when it starts almost getting dark. But they, they're they not like the barn owls that really like the true darkness. The short-eared owl comes out a little earlier. So you actually can see them while it's sort of real dark dusk. And their numbers vary depending on how much, um, how many um, uh, little voles there are out there. And they also like the fact that it's, it's somewhat moist in the winter it, at Wavecrest. And that, that moisture is, is very much liked by the short-eared owl and the, the um, harrier. In fact, the harrier's old name was Marsh Hawk. So that gives you an idea. So this is sort of like the night version of the Harrier. And short eared owls, like I said, have very long wings, but they also have these sort of buffy patches on the wings that show up when they fly. And all of that brown streakiness underneath um, will allow you to identify that it's not a barn owl if you're out there looking for them. Again, usually best times are December through to February to go see the short eared owl. And one of the real common species of, of raptor here that's here all year round, but we have more of them in the winter than in the summer. Same thing with the kite. The kite and the harrier, they're year round in San Mateo County, but we have more of them here in, in the fall winter period than we do in the summer. So we are getting migrants from other parts of California or even farther north. And also, there's a movement of some, some raptors go from the interior areas and come out to the coast in the winter. So my guess is that some of our red-shouldered hawks and our white-tailed kites are not just coming from the north, they're coming from the central valley and coming out here in winter. But we need more information on actual tagged individuals to know those details. But red-tailed hawk is um, part of a group of hawks that the birders called the Buteos, Buteos, B-U-T-E-O, and it's their genus, right? So, you know, how you classify birds, Buteo is a kind of genus of hawk that are soaring hawks. So we could call them the soaring hawks. They have these broad wings that are sort of rounded at the end and kind of broad tails. Now this one's fanning the tail, so it looks particularly broad, but this is a classic Buteo shape. And it's different from the harriers, right, that have longer shapes. And it's different from the kites with their pointed wings and long tails. These are kind of broad wings, broad tails. And the, the red tail, it's, it's a good name, but it's not a perfect name. And it confuses a lot of people because sometimes red tail hawks don't have the red tail. And that's when they're young. So adults have the red tail, young ones don't. So then you start looking at shape, you know, the shape and the head and various other things, including something, some really, really features you would think you'd never look at that don't seem important. But you see, if I look at the head here on the leading edge of the wing, there's this dark area, this dark kind of patch. It happens to be that this dark patch is one of the best ways to know that you're looking at a red tail hawk when it's flying overhead because the other hawks don't have them. So a really contrasting dark patch here, it's called a patagial area, but it's, that's a good way, right on the leading edge of the wing. The other thing is keep in mind that 
red-tailed hawks have, if you look at them from below, they have kind of a dark area on the head, then they get pale on the breast, then they get darker on the belly. It's, this shows up much more clearly on young ones. So it's dark, pale, dark. And then obviously if they're adults, they have all that red on the tail, and then they have all of this um, good stuff, this pale area on, on the upper wings. But here's some other pictures of red-tailed hawks. You see, they're, they're actually quite variable. But, you know, again, if you look at this one on the left, that's actually carrying a bird. It's that dark area in there. And then you think of sort of the dark um, throat, paler breast, and then a darker belly band. Dark, pale, darker belly band. Now, these are adults, so it's a little muted, that pattern. And then when you see the youngsters, it's much more obvious. And then it becomes more useful because youngsters don't have the red tail. So then people say, well, I'm a, how am I gonna identify this thing? It doesn't have the key feature. Well, you just look at the fact that they have this sort of dark, darker throat, paler breast and darker belly band. So darker throat, paler breast, darker belly band. So you go dark, pale, dark, and that is real key. Young, young birds in the red-tailed hawk have pale eyes, so they look kind of mean. The adults look, um, have reddish to orangey to brown eyes. And sometimes the, when the eye is dark, it doesn't stand out that much, but on a pa pale eye really stands out and makes them look kind of aggressive. So if, if you have that aggressive look, and then you see the dark, pale, dark, red-tailed hawk youngster. And uh, the shape is the same, Birds are unlike other creatures that we're, you know, like uh, if, if you know mammals or you have pet dogs or you, you know, live in the farm and you look at mammals a lot, you can identify a young mammal because it's smaller than the adults, right? Um, it takes them time to get to the full size. Birds are not like that. Birds actually, when they fledge and they're ready to go, they're adult size. So size does not help you in terms of identifying a young bird versus an older bird. In fact, in hawks, the feathers, like the, the real key feathers that are, you know, the wings and tail are longer on the young birds than the adults. So they actually look bigger than the adults. So, and so that's, that's tricky. And the reason why is birds have to fly. So once they, have, they, they get out and fly, they need to be proper sized, unlike mammals that don't have to fly. So this is, you know, a juvenile red-tailed hawk. See, no red tail. Um, they can be sort of difficult. Uh, just what do you look for? Well, I see that patch, that patch there on the, on the wing from basically from the head to the band, that dark patch, that's key. I'm seeing a darker head, a little paler thing here. And obviously it's harder to see that dark, pale, dark than this angle, but there you go. And um, the red-tailed hawks too are quite variable at times. Most of our birds are pale, but every so often we get dark morphs. And the dark ones come in cinnamon, like this one, like kind of a, um, you, you can see there's some pattern that's of darker and paler. And there are also quite, as this is quite a bit rare, entirely black ones. And uh, fortunately the adults have the red tail, so that makes it easier. And um, the youngsters in, of these ages though can be quite tough and tricky. And then, um, you know, it's, it's uh, take, take a picture and then show it to somebody who's real expert if you see a young, dark, all dark bird to, to sort it out. But it's the shape of the red-tailed hawk. And in these birds that are dark, but not, entirely black, you can actually see that patch in there, the darker patch is still there. And in fact, you can actually see that it's darker on the throat, paler on the breast and darker on the belly. So some of these features actually still work. They're just harder to see on, on those um, darker birds. Red-shouldered hawk. So red-shouldered hawk, I would say is a patient one because red tails are flying around and they're soaring and they're looking over the environment and they're seeing food from a distance often and will come down from the air to try to get the voles. Sometimes red-tailed hawks will perch in a spot and watch and wait for food to, to come out in the open and then they'll quickly dive down to get it. But red shoulders, they always hunt from a perch. So 
they're patiently sitting there and wait for something to show up and then they will quickly pounce on it or dive on it. So they pick their, their perching places carefully. It's usually right on the edge of where there's some good foraging and they will eat voles, but also they take a lot of lizards and snakes in certain parts of their range. So snakes, lizards are much more of a red-shouldered hawk food. And um, also, if you see these, these two pictures, this is an adult, which is the fancier looking one with the reddish coloration, a more banded tail. And this is a juvenile that's a little bit browner. You see they're both perching on electrical wires, so power lines. That is pretty typical of, of red shoulders. Red tails will also perch on power lines. But if you were to count, you know, the number of hawks you see on power lines versus power poles, the actual poles, it's more likely that you're gonna find a red shoulder on the lines because they're lighter. They're not as heavy as a red tail. So they're more comfortable in that, in that situation while the red tail tends to be more com comfortable in the power post that's, a, you know, it's got more sturdiness to it. So it's not a rule, not a hard, fast rule, but if you sort of look at a lot of them, you'll see that that more common for the wire bird to be the red shoulder. They're also, red shoulders are really uh, loud and they sound almost like a gull when they, they start screaming and it's a real sort of repetitive scream. If you ever, if you're getting into this and you start noticing these weird sounds that sounds almost like a, cackling kind of series of screams, that's probably a red shoulder talk because they have an unusual and loud sound. Um, red shoulder talks are very, very black and white and checkered when you see the adults with their full wings spread. But when they sit down, um, it sort of starts getting lost in the closed wing. But you see there's a lot of black and white sort of zebra striping and the tail also really black and white, not no red on it. Um, the uh, juvenile is a little browner, but you st still see a lot of banding. And in fact, in this case, this individual actually has just grown in an adult tail feather. So he's got one adult tail feather and the, old, the juvenile tail feather. And just, it's something funky here, really sort of detail, but the adults have fewer stripes than the juvenile tails. So you see that the juvenile tail's got one pale stripe, two, three, four, while I'm just seeing two of them on the adult tail feather. So they do change in, in the details of the pattern, but you've got to, you know, that's not really that important. I'm just pointing it out because I just noticed. But um, they're really, really speckly and black and white. So when they fly, you get the sense for the adult that the red shoulder actually is a good name because he's got this reddish kind of shoulder area up here. But I would have called it, you know, zebra hawk if it's an equally valid name, because all that black and white banding on the tail all over the wings, and then also just all black and white checkering is so different from a red tail hawk when you see those patterns. And even the more muted juvenile like this, um, it shows up. They, they have a paler area, sort of kind of a half, um, you know, crescent, like a half moon uh, right here on, on the tips of the wings. And that is unique too, when they fly over and there's light transmitting through the wing, you'll see these sort of two crescents at the, uh, on the wings. That, that's a good way to identify red-shouldered hawks. And when they're, when they're just sitting on the wires and so forth, and they're the juveniles and are kind of brownish, and you think, boy, how do I know this is not a red-tailed hawk? They don't have that dark, pale, dark pattern. They're much more even underneath, sort of speckled and streaked and spotted. So you don't have that pale area on the breast that, that shows up. That's, that's one of the key features. And then look for the real banded nature of the wings, just more speckly. And then maybe a warmth to the head or the shoulders that tells you that coloration of the adult is about to, to come in. When you see them flying, the red tail versus red shoulder, the red shoulder is a little shorter winged and um, smaller and the banded nature of, of, the, of the wings, you can, you can notice in that pale crescent on the, um, near the tip of the wing is a good thing to look for. And also red-shouldered hawks flap a lot and then they glide, so they flap and they glide. Every so often we'll get some unusual things. Uh, I just, this is from two years ago, we had a ferruginous hawk there and 
So sometimes if you're getting into this, you're learning your hawks and you see something that's just totally different, you're thinking, hmm, what is that one? It's not one of the normal ones. Sometimes it isn't the normal one, it's something unusual. So ferruginous hawks um, tend to winter more in the central valley and in more o really open grassy areas. And I'll just point out that they have a really big um, gape, like they have a frowny face because their mouth is really, really big and they can eat bigger prey than a red-tailed hawk can. So they, they prey on a lot of ground squirrels and things that are bigger than um, generally a bird this size would prey on. In the backyard, so if you have feeders and so forth, there's a lot of birds that come to the backyards and these birds become food for hawks. So if you have especially um, morning dove and in particular the collared dove, Eurasian collared dove that has a dark stripe on the back here, the collared doves um, are introduced They've, they've become very common as their numbers have kind of increased throughout the continent. They've actually caused an increase in the Cooper's hawk population in urban and suburban areas because they're a backyard hunter that eats birds and they particularly like these doves. It's the right size for female Cooper's hawks um, as, a, as a food item and the feeders attract them and so forth. But Cooper's hawks now are a different group of of birds, they're not buteos, they're called accipiters. But in any case, they're a bird hawk. Rather than a soaring hawk, they're a bird hawk. And look how long Cooper's hawks are, long and slim. And the youngsters are stripy and the adults have kind of a dark cap, rusty underneath. And here's a backyard Cooper's hawk. There's an, another species I'll show you, the Sharpshin hawk that's very similar, but Cooper's tends to be the standard one you see in the backyard and, mo and throughout the year. Sharpshins only come through in the winter. And um, they, Cooper's is bigger than a Sharpshin and also longer. They tend to have longer necks and bigger heads. So they can be very stripy as juveniles, these Cooper's hawks, and they have a long rounded tail. Um, I should point out that one of the things that makes it really difficult to separate Cooper's from Sharpshin hawk is that raptors are dimorphic in size. That means they have a two morphs, two types. A females are bigger, males are smaller. So that's the dimorphism, two types, big size, small size. Big size is female, small size is the male. So these two are actually um, band, people have, you know, scientists have caught them to put bands on them. And this is a female Cooper's hawk and this is a male Cooper's hawk, same species. But they're so different in size that when you're saying Cooper's hawks are bigger than Sharpton hawk, we have four size classes. We have the big female Cooper's hawk, then they have the male, then the Sharpton female, then the Sharpton male. So the four size classes, the middle two are hard to separate on size alone. The outer two, the female Cooper's and the male Sharpton, much easier on size. But this makes for a kind of difficulty because the sharp shins are actually quite similar to the Cooper socks, see? So they, they have a little smaller head, they have a more squared off tail, so they're not so rounded, they're real squared off and smaller head look to them. Um, sometimes the, the juveniles are a little less streaky underneath, but uh, to me, I just look at sort of a weaker feet, um, smaller size, square tail, um, sometimes a bigger looking eye it gives me a, almost like an owl face on a, a Sharpshin hawk. And keep in mind, again, we usually see them in the fall and in the winter and into the spring, but not in summer. In summer, the backyard bird hunter is always the Coopers and Sharpshins tend to eat smaller prey. So they're looking for sparrows and things like that rather than doves. But um, here's the two back-to-back -back, Coopers and Sharpshins. See, it's pretty tricky, pretty tricky. It's a lot, it's about the head length, the neck, the tail shape. And when they fly, the, the sharp shins have their head kind of is, is inside sort of this little hollow made by the wings. While Cooper's hawks tend to keep the wings straighter and the head sticks out a bit more. So this is sort of the, the, the hard level identification. So I, you know, I'm just going a little fast on this, but um, if, if you're tricked by these birds, just, you know, sort of revert back to the fact that 
they're occipiters, partially because they have these rounded wings and long tails, as opposed to the soaring hawks, which have the broad wings and then the broad short tails. They also flap a lot. They flap three, four times, then they glide, flap three, four times, then they glide rather than soaring, you know, like the red-tailed hawk does all the time. And they're hunting for birds. They're really sneaky and they sort of explode into the scene hunting for birds. Um, we do have eagles in the area up on Skyline, the golden eagle and juvenile golden eagles actually kind of look like this. Um, the adults don't have any white on them, but they do have this little golden area on the back of the neck. The juveniles have all this white on them that is found really on the wings and on the tail base. They're really distinctive. But in terms of Raptor Olympics speed category, I think many of you have heard that the peregrine falcon is the fastest vertebrate so it wins you know um it beats the mammals beats the fish it's the fastest vertebrate in the dive it can go over 240 miles per hour in the stoop but i want to say that i'm going to give points to the golden eagle because the golden eagle is huge it's a massive bird much bigger than the peregrine falcon and it's been clocked at over 200 miles per hour this massive bird in a dive and we give them extra points too, because it has the strongest grip, the talon, those massive claws of the eagle have the strongest grip of any bird in North America and perhaps the Northern hemisphere. I'm not sure about that, but at least North America, 1,200 pounds per square inch. And those talons are sharp. So they can actually kill some rather big prey, believe it or not. We, um, we have the bald eagles, bouncing back. And I'm saying that because their numbers were really, really depressed after DDT and this, you know, sort of in the 50s, 60s, 70s, their numbers really were low. And they've, they've really come back and came back first in the far north and in the east. And they've kind of slowly been coming back in other parts of, of North America. We in California are really at the very tail end of their increase. So we're just sort of the last place for their numbers to really start showing an uptick. And in particular here in this county, in the last few years, we've had them nesting in Pescadero, at the marsh. They're nesting also on, you know, in, um, uh, you know, on the, in the, on the lakes there um, on the reservoir. And um, I've seen them at Wavecrest. Recent, uh, last year, I saw one over my backyard. These things uh, 10, 15 years ago would have been unheard of. So they're inc actually increasing in numbers. And if you think you saw a bald eagle on Highway 92, you're not crazy. You actually probably did see a bald eagle on 90, Highway 92. They're now um, much more common than they were even a few years ago. I will point out though that youngsters are not like you expect them to be. They're brown and they have white on the underwing, sort of right near the body, usually, unlike the um, golden eagles, right? The golden eagles have the white near the tips of the wings and the base of the tail, while the young bald eagles have it near the body and there's a lot of speckled nature to it. When the tail gets white, when they're older, they start showing more of a bald eagle pattern. This, they start getting paler on the head. And of course, the classic um, bald eagles uh, it takes them multiple years to mature. So you can have the white head and not quite have the entire body have become dark yet on these birds that are maybe five years old, like, like the one down there. Um, the fish hawk is the osprey and the osprey has these really crooked wings because what they do is they dive down to catch a fish and they will um, actually dive into the water, feed first, and then they use those crooked wings to sort of you know, almost row themselves out of the water. They need sort of the outer wing to be able to be real flexible in order to get up out of the water. And th they're becoming also more common in, in the county. And you sometimes see them in the harbor or fishing right along the coast, um, also on the bayside. But they're 100% fish eater. They they're, um, have very unique feet. Their talons have almost like little um, hooks on them so to grip onto the fish. And when they grab the fish, they will often put it and handle it so that it points, you know, right in line with, with, uh, with their line of, of flight so that it doesn't cause much drag. But in our Raptor Olympics, this is the diving category. They can dive, you know, as high as 120 feet into the water. 
feet first. And then they've been known to catch a fish that's over four pounds in size. And I've got to say, I don't think, I don't think the, the osprey weighs much more than four pounds. So how they do that, how they can fly with something, their own body weight, I'm not sure. But it's probably got to do with these very long cro crooked wings. And, and you know, in terms of identification, the shape is really unique, but a lot of white underneath, a lot of white underneath and these dark patches on the wings tell you it's, it's an osprey. They will actually remind you of a, a gull when they fly by. They have a gull-like flight. So it's very different from other, other raptors. And we're going to end off with the falcons. The falcons are, there's only a few species, and um, the kestrel is the most common out on wave crest. And the kestrel is the only one of our falcons that doesn't specialize on eating birds. So they eat the voles, they eat big insects, crickets, and all that kind of thing. And they're also really, really a pretty falcon. So the males have this blue and reddish, but all kestrels have two stripes on the face. Even the females that are more rusty, two stripes on the face, not just the one below the eye, but one behind on the head. The two stripes and the fact that they perch often in a really obvious place, or like the kite, they'll do this behavior where they're, they're sort of flying in one spot, looking down, and they will drop down on their prey. That's really, really distinctive. The two birds that do that commonly, American kestrel and the white-tailed kite. Both of them have pointy wings, but the kestrel is not only smaller than the kite, it has all this color. And either the males or females, a lot of rusty. The males have the blue as well, blue-gray. The females, just the rusty. But they're a very long-tailed falcon, and their wings are sharp, but just a tad more rounded than the than the falcons that I'll show you next that have uh, that are eating um, birds. So this is the kestrel, and this is the merlin. The merlin is a bird eater, and they're very fast and very very sneaky. They they seem to know how to sneak up on birds and fly at high high speed, and you know come at them usually in, in the horizontal and just sort of splash onto the scene. All the sparrows go flying, everything sort of freaks out. If you see, ever see that on this sort of bullet of a bird that came out of nowhere in an open area rather than the backyard, it's probably a Merlin. If something like that happens in your backyard, probably a Cooper's hog. But Merlins you see have the little falcon stripe, but it's weak and they're rather sturdy. They look more, um, they look more, uh, they're darker than the kestrel. They don't have the rusty coloration and they look a little bit more muscular, even though they're about the same length as a kestrel, just a little bit more kind of um, thick at the breast and not as um, a long tailed, a little bit more um, speedy as well than, than the um, kestrel. And here you can see the nice sharp wings of a Merlin and how dark they can look. The peregrine falcon, I'll show you in a second, has a much more distinctive face pattern and they're bigger. The peregrines are quite a bit bigger. And this is the fastest bird in the world. And they have the, this dark helmet of, of a pattern in that, that area under the eye, the, the mustache, we call it, is really broad. And um, they're very muscular looking birds. And even in a straight line, they can, they can go in a good, at a good clip. They nest on the devil slide. So if you're out there in spring, sometimes you'll see them um, doing all of these displays. It's a really, the devil slide trails, one of the best places to go and sort of really have a good look at, at peregrine falcons. And you see their, their face has a distinctive helmeted look and they can be paler or darker. Adults always are dark, uh, kind of grayish above. And later I'll show you the juveniles are brown. But in, in in terms of migration, I just wanted to give you some info here um, about some of the birds that fly real long distances. Now, we don't have info on our specific California birds here, the peregrines, but these, these are peregrines that are banded in the desert in Chile and then are tracked all the way to the Arctic and they migrate back and forth. In fact, they have a different route in the fall, they go more coastally and in the spring they go in, in the interior. And what is cool about this is this is a bird that was tracked multiple years and she was given the name Island Girl. And this is Island Girl right here. And I actually happened to see it live 
randomly when I was birding in Chile and I noticed his peregrine had his antenna sticking out of it. And uh, yeah, I saw her down here somewhere. And uh, this actually was Island Girl. And I was able to find the map of her trajectory multiple years as she went back and forth to the Arctic. So that's kind of Olympic level stuff, except um, there are other raptors that we have in the area. Uh, Swainson's hawk is not common here, but in the Central Valley it is. And the Swainson's hawks are going all the way down to Argentina. Um, so real long migrations, um, not all of our hawks do these massive long migrations, but definitely if I was to give distance, um, Raptor Olympics, Peregrine Falcon, Swainson's Hawk. And if you're interested in raptor migration, on the Marin side of the Golden Gate is Hawk Hill. In the fall, go to Hawk Hill. And that's a place where people teach you about how it works. And you can watch migrant hawks flying over right over the city and with you know the bridge there and so forth. It's really kind of a wonderful spot to go and watch hawk migrations. One of the best spots in the in the West to watch hawk migration. Now, the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory is are the people who run Hawk Hill and they've published all sorts of things. I just wanted to end with a little, little story here of the broad-winged hawk. The broad-winged hawk is not that common in the, in the far West, um, but Hawk Hill is a really great place to see them. Every so often they catch one and they put little radio transmitters and they follow them down to the to the Mexico border. They, they're probably going to Central America, these, these little hawks. And I had never seen one in the area, in San Mateo County. And I saw this map and I saw that two of the birds had done the same route right through there, right through the middle of the peninsula. I looked at the map and I thought, you know what, that, that's Skylon Cemetery right up on top of 92. So I went there last season in the fall uh, for the right weather and waited and watched. And I eventually saw five different broadwing hawks flying over exactly where the map told me they would be. So I've never seen them on the coast side, sort of a challenge for you folks as you're getting into this, see if we can find one in, in Wavecrest one day. But um, the fact that they, that you can use the data, scientific data to go and find these birds and that there's a migratory movement that happens right over that cemetery is pretty amazing. And um, here's just a few pictures uh, just to finish off the, the peregrine falcon that I was talking about. These are youngsters, so they're browner, but they still have the same face of the adults. And um, they do eat birds. This is kind of an awkward situation um, right here on the beach, falcon eating a gull and then another a gull watching him eat the gull. <laughs> and, you know, this is, I, I think this is probably not um, unusual. What happens? Sometimes when, when a raptor has made a kill, it's busy with that food and it doesn't have the element of surprise. It's actually, there's, you're safe when a raptor is doing this and the goal just wants to figure out, learn from this situation so that it's not the next one. But thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed, learned something about the raptors. And um, I'll just point out that we didn't have, um, and we, we had the Olympics, but we didn't have a beauty pageant. If you, if you were to pick a raptor worldwide, that's one of the most beautiful, amazing things. Here's a Stellar's sea eagle. That's something that we see on our trips to Japan. So, you know, I do tourism too. So if you're ever interested in an international trip or going out to the ocean out of Pillar Point Harbor, um, find us at Alvaro's Adventures. And thank you very much. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alvaro, and thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, just a quick plug on Alvaro's adventure there. I, I, both as a, a someone who works for the Coastside Land Trust and as a community member, I've heard most incredible things about the trips that Alvaro has been leading out, those pelagic tours. So definitely we'll have a link to that in the, um, the follow-up email. So check those out, see if that's a possibility for you, whether that's something local or as things are shifting around, even something international. So. Um, got to tell you the couple of different people as you've been talking over have shared um, uh, Pamela shared that she saw a bald ego eagle at uh, on your yesterday. Oh, yeah. 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 So. And, you know, you know, we're, we're having more and more eagles, which is great. And I also like we have a lot of people watching this. 
be watching for the condor. One day, the condor population will be enough that they'll start roaming around. And I think Año Nuevo is a place where, where the condors, I know they've actually once were reported there, but they could, they could come back. See, they're on an upswing as well, those condors. So California condor, that is. Um, so a question that, uh, so someone else was saying actually that they saw, Allison was saying that she saw 20 red-tailed hawks soaring and hunting when she was over at Wavecrest when she was doing a count one day. Um, she's wondering uh, how much time per day they're actively hunting and how often do they make kills? She, she's kind of like, like the whole picture of it. How often do, are they making kills? How much do they need to survive? And how um, the span of the day, how long, how, how that's long a good that feel that? That's a good question. I think it probably depends on various things. So if, if they're not nesting, they're really just trying to maintain their, you know, just sort of maintenance, you know, rather than having to produce an egg or so on. It probably, they probably need more food when it's colder than when it's warmer, just, just you know, in terms of, um, but I bet, I bet they're taking something like four, four to six, you know, voles a day i'm just kind of guessing you know um but birds tend to have high metabolisms even even hawks you know obviously little hummingbirds are you know have to take in their full body weight <laughs> in in a day or so but but hawks uh, are still pretty high metabolism so i think they're taking a good amount of prey in a day yeah so they need densities and they're pretty good at finding it so especially on those higher, that sort of the cycle you're talking about, those three yeah. cycles too, yeah. And the, the more food there is, the less time they spend hunting because it's easier, right? So, yeah. Well, Gary Deggy uh, shared also in respect to high numbers of raptors in September of 2007, he counted 100 white-tailed kites while standing at the model airplane field. I knew I'd heard that info and it, it would have to be Gary. That's great. Yeah. Yes. I should have, I should have asked him because he would have had the info. That's, uh, but I remembered somebody saw a hundred plus. Or, yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you, Gary. And Steve Mahler, he does a lot of the, this incredible photography, as you know, on the coast. Um, and so I, it's no question that he's at, he's talking about vision. Um, with the, I'm thinking of him also in his drones looking down below. Um, but he said, fascinating about the UV vision. Can any raptor see into the infrared spectrum to sense animals by their body heat? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. UV is definitely, and um, the, some of the people studying this are, are realizing that a lot of birds are actually seeing pattern sort of in, in their own plumages that, that we don't see. So some birds that we think of as dull, they're seeing themselves actually with all these other patterns in UV light that look a lot fancier than, um, but I don't know about, yeah, heat vision, heat vision goggles would be great for a raptor to have, but I'm not sure that they do. That's, I'll have to look into it. <laughs> we had someone asking about, so you, you talked about sort of typically how you can tell the difference between um, males and females by size. Are there any other tips for distinguishing male and female white-tailed kites or, or to follow that same role of size? Um, and, you know, since I was going quickly through some of this stuff too, the real big differences in sizes tend to be in the bird eaters. Weirdly enough, the mammal eaters are less different in size and then the fish eaters are even less. So kites being mammal eaters, they're, the, the males are smaller than the females, but pretty marginally. They're not, they're not that different in size. So really you can't tell. Um, I wouldn't feel safe, you know, unless, you know, they were mating or something where you could <laughs> see, the, see them like, but yeah. <laughs> well, and Bill Holland just said he wanted to add, of course, with what you talked about at the beginning that, that there are resident nesting birds that are quite active and visible from spring through the fall, right? But, um, at the end that there are additional birds that only visit in the winter or visit in greater numbers in the winter. Yeah. We talked yeah. About it as well. And when, when they are nesting to keep, keep in mind that, you know, stay away from the nests and, you know, give them their space. So the, the, the birds are obviously, you know, we, um, that's one of the most susceptible times for them, you know, so 
when if you find a nest out there somewhere and you want to get a picture, that's great, but just make sure you're not disturbing them. So um how so someone was talking about a juvenile. They saw a juvenile at a wave crest last week. How long are red-tailed hawks juveniles? How how long are they in that stage considered to be a juvenile? The young red tails I keep that brown plumage for a year. So they yeah, it's about a year that they have that and then they start shifting and getting their red tail. The um, I think the kites are probably similar, um, but it's it a lot of their they're so similar to the adults that a lot of the information, the stripiness probably wears away. So they start looking more adult like by the middle of winter. Yeah. Um, well, this one, this is interesting. This is more specific and uh, specifics about where you would see which raptors in wave crest. And he was saying, um, great talk. But he said at the end of this, at the end of this talk, would it be possible for you to give us a little more information about where in wave crest we have the best chance of seeing which raptor? And at what um, time of day? you did talk about day, time of day, but yeah, and um, I think I think you probably follow up with also like how to get to wave crest right we had uh, we were thinking you know later giving people an idea of we don't want to I always get I'll have confusing directions if I but there's I don't know I give them up <laughs> but let, I think he's talking more about specifics of like yeah. in wave crest maybe yeah yeah I think I would I would say that I just go there and just start looking and seeing where the activity is but the more grassy areas right in the middle are going to be where the kites and the harriers are, and then the more towards the edge where the shrubbery and the trees are, that's where you're going to see more red-tailed hawks and red shoulders um, sitting up there or flying around. Um, in in winter, if it's a, a nice sunny day, a lot of the red tails start soaring more. If it's more of a cloudy day, they there's tend to be sitting more. But um, I would uh, I would just sort of look look around um, and just see kind of visually scan to see where the activity is. And, you know, that also the kestrels tend to be over the grassy open area. So right in the middle of it, I would say. <laughs> and that's also, that's good information to start. And it's a good call to sort of what you talk about, about just getting out there in the, the journey of it, right? Just getting out there yeah. exploring and, and kind of making those assessments as you go. Um, and, and to Alvaro's point, he has given us a great link to this. Uh, Sequoia Audubon has this um, San Mateo uh, County Birding Guide that we'll, uh, we'll attach to our upcoming webinar or our email follow up. So take a look out for that because it it's actually gives a lot of information and, and a lot of different points um, to, to, to get you to Wavecrest, but also other birding areas. Um, someone asked, were, were red-shouldered hawks once called red belly hawks? Mm, not, not in my time, but there's a red belly newt, a little salamander. <laughs> <laughs> That's what comes to mind, but sometimes all of these yeah, concepts get garbled. Yeah, um, red belly, yeah. No, there's a red belly woodpecker, but nope. Um, Steve is asking another question. Steve Muller is asking another question about if they're so vocal, doesn't it turn off uh, that it doesn't tip off their potential prey to stay in their burrows? It seems that many raps, raptors are noisier than I would have thought. Um, it, I, I don't think voles are that clever, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that they, um, I, you know, I think they tend to be, when they're being vocal, red shoulders are usually, they're usually not hunting. Um, they're, they're interacting with other red shoulders. And then when they're hunting, they tend to be quite quiet and then they sit patiently. So they have, you know, it's sort of a time of their being, doing their vocal thing and other times when they're not, so. Mm -hmm. And someone else was pointing out, I think you said, uh, last year, was last year a boom year for rodents? I noticed so many compared to this year. Yeah, yeah. that was a boom year last year. That's right. And where was that in the three-year cycle? You know, I, 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 I've never tracked it really, but that would be the high part of the cycle. But I've never tracked exactly if it's three or four, or, you know, but it, there's sometimes a little lee, you know, but it tends to be three, four years that the cycles are at. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good question. Are there things that can be done to improve wave crest, wave crest as a raptor habitat? Hmm. 
Um, I don't know. Um, it's a good question I, to be thinking about, though. Because, um, you know, there's there are elements of long-term change that you wonder if, for example, it it's it's a benefit at this point to have the the line of trees, the cypress, but you wouldn't want the cypress to start growing into the open habitat. And similarly, you want to have a good amount of grass rather than just coyote bush. But the 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 water in winter when when it when it gets wet out there, that actually kills off, I think, a lot of the, the coyote bush, you know. Um, so it maintains that whole patchwork. Now, if, if we start getting real dry winters consistently, will the coyote bush start filtering into the areas that tend to be wet in winter? That's a good question, because if, if it does become fully coyote bush, it, we will lose, you know, the, the some of the raptor activity there, the, yeah. you know, the, the kites, the harriers um, would, you know, would not do as well. But that's more long term watching how that happens. And if we, you know, droughts, etc. Right, right. Um, uh, there's someone here has two questions. They said, what month did you see? Do you see the broad winged hawks at Skylon? Oh, that, that's, it's uh, late September, early October. That's the kind of, yeah, mid-September to the first week of October, sort of the, the window. Um, and if you're really keen on migration, Golden Gate uh, Raptor Observatory on their website, they actually have a running total of what they're seeing when they're counting. So it's like instant instant numbers, like you can be, watching the numbers. So I remember like going up there and actually watching the, the numbers of birds that they were seeing in the Golden Gate saying, okay, this is a good day today. I, if they're, if they're going to go by, it's going to be today. And sure enough, you know, they, they went over. So it was, I know it's kind of weird, but it was kind of fun to do that little, you know, little putting it all together. <laughs> What about when this person also asked, what months do you see the kestrels the most? Um, they, they start arriving in September and they're around till March. So it's really the whole um, fall winter that the kestrels are around. Summer, they, they go inland to breed or, you know, in the hills. So they're not here on the coast much. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone else was asking, oh, this is neat. They, they were wondering if you've which, witnessed juvenile red tails playing with each other. They said they saw two romping around with a pine cone. <laughs> you, you know, um, raptors like crows and jay, I, you know, and, and ravens and stuff because they, there's a lot of skills that need to develop. And they're also, you know, they're big animals. They will interact with each other and kind of use play as a learning kind of um, situation and and you will see sometimes juvenile hawks doing funny things and that later when they become serious adults they won't do it anymore uh -huh. <laughs> kind of like us you know yeah yeah right <laughs> um, wait you as kids <laughs> about, about what <laughs> someone had asked a question about confirm um yeah steve reddick had asked a question about uh confirmed uh, eagle and uh, bald eagle and golden eagle sighting, and someone else just posted that they there was a confirmed golden eagle sighting in Wavecrest in 2019. Anything since then? Any confirmed? Um, they they well, golden eagles in in the winter. Well, they actually do breed in the county. There's a few, very few, but in winter we do get them up in the hills. So if you're if you're driving around in winter, going up. Tunisia's Creek Road and watching and, you know, in, in Pescadero area and so on. There are golden eagles in the area in more in winter. Um, right on the sort of coastal uh, prairie, you know, sort of um, where Wavecrest is, they're much less common. So I've actually once saw golden eagle fly over my house here in Half Moon Bay um, in you know, in more than 10 years of being here, now actually 17 years. So they're pretty rare right on this coastal terrace, mm -hmm. but they're not that rare once you go into the sort of foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains in winter. It's weird how 
you know, that's, that's not that far as, as the eagle flies, but they just, I guess, don't have the right food here. They're looking for bigger food, mm -hmm. you know, rabbit, brush rabbits and other things, so. Um, question about, you know, a lot of us have observed the ravens and the hawk interaction where it seems like the ravens are, or crows are ganging up on the hawks and harassing mm -hmm. them. Could you speak to that at all? Um, yeah, ravens are super intelligent and they, they, um, do things cooperatively so they I think there's part of it's just a sort of a game for them but also if they're nesting ravens will drive try to drive any hawk away from the nesting area because then they're vulnerable but otherwise they're they're just sort of like the smart kids <laughs> who are taunting the <laughs> the hawk you know they, they they they're very clever so I think they, they just know they can get away with it, almost like dolphins do all sorts of odd things in the ocean too, where they're, you know, taunting the sharks, that, that type of thing, so. <laughs> you have two people asking about the energy drain of these kites and how, you know, if they're doing this flapping, this hovering, it's such an energy drain. Um, well, it's not too bad because they always do it into the wind. So the wind is, they're always head, you know, if you want to know the direction of the wind, watch a, a kiting kite or kestrel, they'll tell you their head's always to the wind and that way they get a little lift. So they're, they're basically using the wings to stay in one spot, but they're not actually using the wings to that much to get the lift. That's the winds providing that. So you'll see them actually doing more maneuvering of the tail and all these things to just to stay in one place. And, and that's key because they need to see that food right below them. And then once the food is available, they drop down and it's worth it. You know, it's, it's a way to hunt that's so specific. Like you're straight above the animal and these, these voles don't have, their eyes are, you know, they're looking ahead and looking at the grass. They're not looking above them. So they're completely defenseless, defenseless. If they, they pop out into the open, the kite will just drop in on them, so. Okay. Didn't know what hit him. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't laugh, right? Poor things. <laughs> but, but it's, but I, I don't know. They're not so bright. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question about the um, raptor habitat in eucalyptus. Someone was asking, can you comment on eucalyptus as a good or bad species for raptor habitat? In general, eucalyptus is bad all around. Um, if you're the only benefit of eucalyptus is that they have height and sometimes you will, if, if you have a higher tree, a red-tailed hawk or a, 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 an owl will nest in that tree, but it's not because it's a eucalyptus, it's because it's just a big tree. It could be other trees too, or it could be even, you know, various other things, but um, that is the one benefit of eucalyptus. They, they suck up water. They're really bad for you know, maintaining, if we have natural wetlands and you and we have eucalyptus right around, they're, they're sucking up most of the water. So, um, and their fire danger, they, uh, they acidify, well, they change the soil below them so native plants can't grow. I, I just, you know, don't think there's very much good about eucalyptus and, and well, now we also worry about fires in general around where we live. I mean, I, I do think that it's a very good thing that they're starting to try to get rid of some of the eucalyptus in, in El Granada. It'd be nice eventually if, if there's other trees, smaller, smaller, shrubbier, uh, wildlife friendly um, vegetation that can, that can be um, there, that doesn't need any water and so forth, mm -hmm. um, native vegetation. But um, other than height, and sometimes hawks nest in them. I just don't think eucalyptus is that um, good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a eucalyptus lover. It, you know, in Australia, I would be happy. That's where they're from and that's where they belong. But, you know, here they cause a lot of issues. Um, a few more questions. Are you okay to power through a couple more questions? Yeah. Here? Okay. I'm like trying to maybe close them off. <laughs> they keep coming in. I'm like, oh, uh, these are great questions though. Do uh, sharp shin hawks perch on poles or wires? Um, they usually, if it's an occipiter, one of these long bird hawks sitting on a really exposed situation, it tends to be a cooper's. 
I find sharp shins will perch on trees and shrubs and fences and other things, but I, I don't tend to see them up on poles that much. They're a little obvious. Well, it might be skewed because coopers are so much more common than sharp shins, but they're sneaky. I'll, I'll, I'll see them sometimes, both coopers and sharp shins come into my backyard and go right in the middle of a tree so you can't see where they are. And they'll sit there for long enough that all the other birds start coming around and then they jump out and surprise them to try to catch one. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I did see a question too about the na name change of the kite. That's a, that's a, an e easy one that it used to be, you know, they went from white tail to black shoulder to white tail. It's changed names because there's another species that's found in Europe and Africa that they used to think of the same type as ours. But once they were separated, we realized, oh, there's two different species. The one in, in Africa, Europe kept the name black shouldered kite and then white tail kites just for the one that's found all the way from here down to Chile. So it's fully an American bird in the sense of Americas as South, North, Central. Um, okay, so any of these other questions? Let's see, there's a couple more. About What about herons, blue herons migrating? I know we're not seeing that much, but um, migrate. Yeah, great blue herons um, migrate, especially less so here than, than in the East, where the, you know, any situation where the water freezes, the herons tend to get out of there. Um, so we have year round herons here, but there's movements, they, they do migrate. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what the local movements are like, but um, uh, there are, they, I, you sometimes do see them flying over high up and going south, you know, and you think, okay, that's a migrant, but I couldn't tell you who, where they're coming from, where they're going. Okay. Um, what about lifespans and some of the raptors? Do the larger birds like eagles live longer? Yeah, larger, larger birds in general live longer. And if you think that an eagle takes six or so years to mature, then you just logically, they have to be living 20, 30 years, if not more sometimes. So um, smaller birds mature more quickly, bigger birds mature more slowly and live longer. So these you know, hawks that mature in one year probably have shorter lifespans than the eagles that are maturing in five or so years. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Oh, this is so red-tailed hawks. When do they approximately, when do they stop being fed by their parents? Um, they, it's sort of like once they're flying around, they're still fed for a while and then they, the parents slowly kind of get less, in, they're less interested in bringing them food and then they they eventually will have to start hunting on their own mm -hmm. but it's a few it's a few weeks I think of being provisioned but each time less and less so it's not like one day they just stop I think they just sort of slowly do less less of it until the, and then they you know then they will eventually just become aggressive towards them if they're if they shift to you know not recognize them anymore as they're as young but they're just another competitor <laughs> eventually that's what happens there's no boomerang hawks, I'll tell you that much. They won't come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, uh, so Peter was asking, are Swainsons over, ever overwintering in the Delta or elsewhere in California? Yeah, so um, the California Swainsons hawks in the Central Valley, there's a few of them that winter there rather than doing the big long trip down to South America. What, what was, some brand new information about Central Valley strains and socks that's kind of neat is that most of them don't go to Argentina. They actually, there's a population that goes to Mexico, a few of them that go down to like uh, El Salvador, a few that actually go into some um, grassland habitats in Colombia. And then, so if, if you look at strains and socks in the whole, most of them go to Argentina, but our California ones actually have a much more nuanced migration and some of them actually stay so we, and, and others just go a little further others much further so it's an interesting thing to keep on studying mm -hmm. but that's that's relatively new info on those california swingsons mm -hmm. 
All right, I have two more, and then I think that a couple others might be might be coming in after, but we've closed that out. Okay. So, um, if I would just say, if there's a if your question isn't answered, I think there's a couple more that are coming in right now. But um, reach out to Alvaro at Alvaro's Adventures, and and while you're on there, while you're on his website, take a look at some of the tours because there's this might be a great opportunity to learn a lot more. But um, uh, so Gregory Johnson asked, uh, you said at the beginning you were talking about owls really quickly, and and another bird that prefer the moist soil of Wavecrest area. Um, can, or you know other places too. Can you elaborate on this a little bit more? Yeah, the harrier um, and and the um, short-eared owl they they have a tendency to prefer grasslands that have moisture or are um, wet for part of the year. So so that I don't know if it's partially because that concentrates their food, or it might be that that creates the right patchwork of ha habitat of grass and a little wetter. But um, the both of those birds, the short eared owl and the harrier will actually hunt over cattail marsh at times. So they, if in the east, for example, they will be in those habitats, really truly just marsh habitats. And uh, they, they like that moisture to some extent while I showed you a picture of the rare ferruginous hog, rare for us. They like really dry grasslands, so they don't like moisture much at all. So how, why or how or I think it's the it's the it's just what you notice. Some birds have some preferences, others have other preferences. It's definitely those two like that moisture and that clay soil we have here maintains moisture much more so than than a, you know, a sandy soil would. So that's a benefit um, to the, for those birds. Um, and this is the last question we'll hit today, um, which is that this, this attendee was sharing that, that for the last two weeks, they've, been, they've seen um, two juvenile Cooper's hawks um, uh -huh. hunting together close to the nest. And they were wondering if how off, for how long these juvenile Cooper's hawks would um, hunt together. Close to the nest. That, that's interesting. Um, there, there are some species of raptors that are cooperative hunters. Um, the classic one is Harris, Harris's hawk. In the, so you'll see them in Texas and Arizona, more desert habitats. They actually cooperate. And I, I've heard of uh, Cooper's hawks actually hunting in a cooperative fashion, um, but I don't know much about it. Um, I don't know if they're just juveniles and they they're you know they're together still just because they're comfortable being together or if they're actually hunting cooperatively but I have heard of it in Cooper's hawks so that's kind of interesting that, that there's probably yeah I don't know how to answer it except that sounds cool to me <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> it's great for people to be sharing this information too things that they're seeing along the way mm -hmm. um all right, well, thank you. And thank you for all this time and answering all of these questions. Um, yeah, so thank, thank you. for asking about where um, to, to you know, about where to, to where Wavecrest is and some different places to, for birding sites or questions about these different areas. Alvaro has shared a link with us that we'll, we'll share again in that follow-up email, which is what we, what we were talking about before, which is from the Sequoia Audubon Society, San Mateo County um, Birding Guide, Birding spaces um, and it's great there's a wealth of information on there too so not just how to get there but lots of information about these areas and habitats there um, and then uh, you know a couple of other questions came through about binoculars that you were hope you know that you were using and um, uh, that you would recommend and, um, and any of those other questions that we didn't get to that are specific about that um, oh, <laughs> which ones are those <laughs> I, I use uh, a brand called uh, Kawa K-O-W-A, they're Japanese. They're very good binoculars and they're, they're, um, there are pricier brands, but um, I think this is a good, like if you're really kind of getting serious, they're sort of the higher end brands and out of the higher end brands, I think it's probably, they're the, the best bang for your buck, but they're still pricey. Uh, yeah, there's others that are even pricier and I'm not sure I see any better through them. But the main thing about binoculars other than your price range is to hold them, to go and see them live in some place, hold them and use them because the actual feel of the binocular and the, 
how they sit in your hand is really important. And some binoculars don't feel right to some people and other, or even, or the little cups here that, you know, and if you wear glasses, there are various things to, so I, you, I can't necessarily say this is a binocular for everybody because you really have to kind of have that feel of, of what they, the weight and the balance and all that. There's, yeah, I mean, it varies. Yeah, you can't just hop on and look at reviews and hope to kind of blindly pick, yeah. Right, yeah, you can, the, you, get, you can get good reviews on the quality of the optics and so forth, but that, that hand feel is, you know, if you can imagine, it's, it's um, if you're gonna be using them a lot, that, that means, means quite a bit. And I don't like binoculars to be too light. I like a little weight because I, I hold them steadier if there's a bit of weight to them. So, thank you. Yeah. So, um, just a reminder to people before anyone clicks off, just the, just the importance of donation. And I know Alvaro spoke to that. I know Joe Chamberlain spoke to that. Um, if you haven't had a chance to donate, or you feel that you can sort of periodically donate to the Kosai Land Trust, um, it does help us to keep these this free community web webinar going. Um, it certainly always goes to help protect our public lands. It also helps to support our vital Kosai Land Trust programs. So um, if you haven't, or if this is an opportunity where you might be able to do that again, we would really, of course, always appreciate it. Um, I know our Raptors will too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, thank you very much, Alvaro, for this presentation. It's always one that people really, really appreciate and know that these, this is going to come out in a follow-up email for everyone, so you'll you'll get a recording of this. So share it, please. This is yeah. that Alvaro is sharing with all of you, um, and uh, for you to be able to get out there and learn a little bit more about the raptor population. And about a year ago, um, Alvaro did a, a multi-part series. It's also on. Um, you can get on our website and look at our past webinars, and you can see the recording um, of some of the shoreline birds and uh, backyard birds and birds around town and, and another um, piece on, on raptors. And um, so that is, it would be a great, if this is something that piqued your interest and this is new to you, or you just, there's other areas of birds you wanna learn about, those are great, those are great to access and look back at. And even if you saw them before, sort of now that you're orienting today, just be able to look back. Um, we do have a couple of uh, webinars coming up. We have a webinar coming up in September um, and that is on sea level rise in the San Mateo um, coast. And it's gonna be talking with some folks involved with the US geological study and the impacts of, um, and work being done right now at a large scale and also a San Mateo um, RCD, so Resource Conservation District. Um, and then also in October, we're gonna be doing a, a presentation on the conservation ecological role of bats. So anyway, thank you very much to all of you who stuck around and thank you to Alvaro again. And- um, Thank you. Don't forget to hop on his website and check him out and see all the work that he has done and is doing and um, the opportunities for you to connect with him. And uh, we will see you all in a little over a month for the sea level rise. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.